Hi all, I'm Carrie, and welcome to my channel. My plan for this video is to give you some backstory on my Regency era Bell historical cosplay and plenty of details about its construction to inspire you to make your own Bell cosplay, Regency gown, or any other historical Disney cosplay. You may have noticed a Disney trend in the historical costuming and costume community lately. Lady Rebecca Fashions, So Steen Costuming Drama, Abby Cox, Morgan Donner, Enchanted Rose Costumes, and many others have reimagined Disney characters and clothing from different historical eras, or in historically accurate sales. I'm easily distracted, so I thought this could be fun. I used to love Disney as a kid, and now I have Disney Plus because of The Mandalorian, so I listened to and sometimes watched a bunch of older Disney movies and decided on Snow White for reasons. But while making the yellow underdress, I rewatched Beauty and the Beast, the animated version, not the bizarro live action remake that makes me cringe just thinking about it. Anyway, I remembered how much I have in common with Belle. Stuff like, we're both brunettes, our eyes are different colors depending on the light, we both have French ancestry, and most importantly, I believe, we love reading so much, we walk and read simultaneously. Read walking or walk reading? is how I managed to keep my sanity and while earning my Master of Arts in English at the university where I teach geology full time because I could get my steps in, tamp down my anxiety, and avoid falling asleep while reading certain literary theorists. Nobody called me a funny girl, at least to my face, but many have commented something like, how do you do that? I would run into something or watch out. I am watching out. Peripheral vision, kids, peripheral vision. And I don't read to sheep, but I do occasionally read to my cats. Not that you need to identify at all with most Disney characters before making a historical or other cosplay version of them. The ones not appropriating marginalized cultures are up for reinterpretation as parts of pop culture. So I went from Snow White to a dress that could work both for her and for Belle, and through my tangled mental process, I also developed a backstory for a specifically early Regency version of Belle's yellow dress because it's historically possible and, well, it's just how my mind works. Despite the almost indecipherable time period for her ball gown, most of the other fashions in the film look 18th century, if you squint. So I'm imagining the film took place in mm, 1785 or so, and Belle's poor provincial town is just behind the times in terms of fashion. 25 years later, Belle and her prince, what the heck is his name, are in their mid-40s like me, and are in England where they fled to escape the reign of terror in France. Fabric is super expensive, and Belle decides to have her yellow gown remade into the modern, neoclassical, high-waisted style. As a kid, I envisioned her gown was made of soft, flowy fabric, although now I know most fancy formal 18th century gowns were made of stiffer silks with a heavier hand, like damask, brocade, taffeta, and satin. Belle's floaty yellow fabric is perfect for the diaphanous styles of the early 19th century, when fine cotton muslins were all the rage. While Belle's yellow gown looks vaguely mid-Victorian, 18th century mantua makers cut most skirts in rectangles, salvage to salvage for ease of alteration and refashioning later on. There is surely enough fabric in her skirt to make an empire waist gown. Fabric is the most expensive aspect of clothing oneself, so it was smart to economize and think about future use, even decades later, of high quality silks, wools, cottons, and even some linens. Most of my costume history books contain examples of gowns and even menswear that reveal evidence of alteration into newer styles. And some even have fabric that significantly predates the style of the garment itself by nearly a century. Imagine if we treated the fabric of our own clothes as such a precious commodity to reuse and refashion until it absolutely wore out. The environmental, economic, and social implications are worth pondering in our age of fast fashion and throwaway culture. As a participant in our consumer culture, I bought this lovely soft sheer canary cotton sateen from Renaissance Fabrics that perfectly encapsulates my conception of Belle's skirt fabric. I knew it would work with fig leaf patterns number 220 because I've made that pattern previously in cotton wool. Mackenzie, the proprietress and pattern drafter for fig leaf, generates patterns from extant garments and gives all the original construction details so you can learn about historical construction and, if you so desire, make a faithful recreation. 
The silk taffeta ball gown Mackenzie used for Pattern 220 was once a 1790s style gown with a lower waistline, further evidence for the propensity for refashioning precious fabric. I made several changes to the construction techniques in the pattern to at once simplify and complicate the process, and I'll go over those in detail. I'd love to know if you've made up this pattern or plan to, or what your favorite Empire Waist Regency style dress pattern is in the comments below. The bodice lining pattern in Fig Leaf 220 reflects the older 1790s style gown, the same as in the extant garment, and is a good two inches longer than the fashion fabric bodice. So I cut my lining to be the same as the bodice because my yellow cotton is much more sheer than the original silk taffeta. I also use my sewing machine to sew all of the lining seams, the skirt seams, and some of the bodice fashion fabric seams. I used a zigzag stitch to finish all of the skirt seams. Mackenzie provides details on how to finish the seams in the historically accurate manner, but I was going for speed. The extant gown was made to fit a very tall woman, 5'8 to 5'10, and I am not tall. When I made my white wall version, I had to put in five tucks to make the skirt the right length because I refused to cut off any of the length after I had already sewed it together by hand. Well, five tucks is a lot, and for Belle's dress, I wanted a fluffier skirt decoration like ruffles, which were in fashion on morning and visiting gowns. Some extant gowns even show ruffles and flounces superimposed over tucks to update them to a newer style, so I felt justified in my decision. I shortened all four skirt pattern pieces by seven inches, redrawing the gore edges on the bias to be straight, and then truing the seams, which just means I made sure the seams matched up. This pattern reminds me of 18th century construction techniques because it calls for constructing the lining and then laying the fashion fabric down on top of the lining, wrong sides together, folding the fashion fabric under at the seam edges and stitching it to the lining. Here are the bodice fronts, pleats pinned, then machine basted, and then stitched down onto the lining at the side seams. The bodice front lining is then attached to the fashion fabric and basically consists of two rectangular modesty panels. I meant to extend the length of these panels because they did not quite meet in the middle in my white voile gown, but this is not a big deal. The pleated and ruffled front makes them invisible, but keep this in mind and check the size if you want to actually pin the lining closed at the center front. The top of the fashion fabric bodice front is a drawstring closure, and I just use unbleached cotton yarn and a tapestry needle to string it through the channel. The shoulder strap lining is narrower than the fashion fabric, so you can wrap the ladder around the neck edge and whip stitch it in place, only catching the lining fabric. Then the rest of the shoulder strap is sewn down, again using 18th century methods. Then it was time for the sleeves. But instead of the usual sleeve headache, one reason I love this pattern is that the sleeves always work out so well. I added a cotton muslin sleeve lining, which is not in the pattern, to bulk up the wispy yellow sateen and make it hold its puff shape a little bit better, and to hide the sleeves of my shift underneath. If you use opaque fashion fabric, you can forego this step or see how it works with a sheer fabric and no lining. I marked all pleating lines on the sleeves, all 57 million of them, with a friction marker, but only in the seam allowance or where it would be covered by the center sleeve band, in case the marker did not disappear completely when ironed, which it did not. Then it was time to pleat the sleeves. I did not follow the directions and pleat one row at a time and instead pleated both the bottom and the middle row as I went along and then the top row. That is a lot of pins, so I machine basted the pleats down to make them behave while I finished the sleeves. I machine sewed the sleeve lower band, folded it under, and finger pressed it in place, and then whip stitched it to the inside of the sleeve. You could do this the opposite and then stitch it to the outside so you can see the stitches like in the original. 
I then pinned and hand stitched the middle band on the sleeves. I think all this pleating and the band give the gown a unique look and in a soft cotton really evokes the sleeve bands of neoclassical art and early 19th century interpretations of it. And these sleeves fit perfectly into the arm size with clearly labeled backs, fronts, and where the sleeves should line up with the bodice so I was able to machine stitch them on with confidence. I then zigzag stitched the raw edges and whip stitched them down towards the sleeve, only going through the aligning fabric. If your sleeves do not fit exactly, you can easily add or subtract pleats at the sleeve head as needed. Instead of two waistband pieces seamed at the center back, I cut one long one to omit that seam and back stitch the waistband to the bodice. Then it was time to attach the skirt. Somehow, despite truing the seams and checking carefully, I ended up with a stair step top edge of the skirt. This is because I sewed from the bottom up, which I know you're not supposed to do, but I find it easier to deal with problems at the top of gourd skirts where there is less circumference, at least in Regency gowns. I cut along what was supposed to be the fold line of the skirt fronts and skinny triangles from the side back gores to get a smoother line. Then I pleated the skirt back as per directions, but shifted the other pleats to the skirt back and just made one small pleat on either side of the opening at the front of the dress and one at each of the side back seams to cover them and help the skirt flare out a bit at the waist. Pleat to flatter your body shape always and I love the way mine turn out. Instead of folding over the top edge and overhand stitching the skirt to the bottom of the waistband, I avoided raw edges by placing the top edge of the skirt inside the waistband, which only works with very thin fabrics, and I backstitched it in place. The skirt length ended up being perfect. No tucks needed, and it was time to hem it, which I did by hand and move on to the ruffles. Again, I was going for speed, so I took five inch wide strips of fabric, selvage to selvage, sewed four together at the selvages to make a big circle, then folded that lengthwise and pressed it, zigzag stitched the edges, then ran a gathering stitch one half inch from the edge. Then I pinned it evenly using the halving method, zigzag edge down along a line marked on the skirt with a friction pen. I pulled up the gathers, adjusted them, and machine sewed the ruffle on, then pressed it downwards. I don't know if this saved time or not, but I think I prefer the hand sewing method of hemming single layers and roll whip gathering the top and then attaching it to the skirt. I also added flowers to the ruffles, which you'll see here in a minute. First, I want to show you how I trim my Timely Tresses Regency bonnet. I cut a headband of the ribbon and hand sewed it in place, then tried making four loop bows several times, practicing with pink ribbon, before I finally made some I like and attached them over the bonnet ties at the sides and on the top or tip of the hat. Yay! After almost two years, the hat is trimmed. I'll add flowers to the hat later, but for now, I did not want them to detract from the flowery buttercup soft flower floatiness of this gown, which I doubted I would like for a while, but once I added those ruffles and the pink roses, I absolutely love it. I think it will even look pretty without the flowers, but I added them in a moment of worry that I would look like a giant peep, and to add to the bell iconography. Many costumers I admire, like Fresh Frippery and Enchanted Rose Costumes, have used red roses in their historical bell cosplays, and the red definitely pops and is beautiful, but it is in line with the live action film, whereas the rose in the animated version is definitely more pink to me, and yes, the prince give be gives Belle a pink rose in the Christmas special, and I just like pink better. By the way, the paper roses on the skirt are leftovers from my dear sweet friend Christine's teal Madame du Pompadour gown, and I love that I have that connection with her. The hem length of my new gown is perfect for walking and reading, and I love the weight of the ruffles and the way they flare out as I walk. Here I am reading Fanny Burney's letters and diary, reminiscing about the 1780s when I met my beast prince, even though I still don't know his name, and became friends with the talking teapot, grumpy clock, and candlestick, or candelabra. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing, and let me know what you think in the comments. Do you have any Disney remakes planned? 
Thanks to all my subscribers and for all donations on Ko-fi. Your encouragement keeps me creating. Thank you and have a lovely day. Help me. Where are you going? You're making noise over there. What are you talking about? What are you doing? Me? Can I say hi? Can I say hi? Can I say hi, Jordan? Yeah.